two more lectures on the principles, then we're going to definitely be going into the applications of microbiology. But this is actually where it gets a little more pertinent because this is kind of with the sort of looking at the actions that the microbes have and actually what they will actually will start doing uh, things for us, uh, whether it's beneficial or detrimental. But I'm going to open it up with a simple question. You got a bowl of sugar full of energy, right? Carbon. Why does it not spoil? You can leave it out on the tabletop. It can be moistened, but bacteria or many microorganisms will not grow on it. Why is that? It seems to be a simple question, but that's the kind of questions I get often from people when they try to apply microbiology. Um, I give it everything it seems to want, but it just does not happen. So the main objective to this lecture is, number one, is to figure out why would a bacterium not grow on a bowl of sugar? All right? Microorganisms, like all of us, I mean, we have to take in our daily allowance of food, and we have to keep it nutritionally balanced. You know, we all hear about, you know, you know, vitamin deficiencies or, you know, deficiencies of, you know, energy, calories. All is the detrimental. But a microorganism has to get the same thing, a balanced diet. You know, so they do have to either take in things like a vitamin or be able to produce it themselves. So they do have to maintain a similar nutritional balance. You know, obviously they will still need the macronutrients. You know, we do need our carbon. We do need our hydrogen, oxygen nitrogen and phosphorus, sulfur, and all that. And you can get a sense, you know, basically what some of the sources might be. But it's rather interesting. I still encounter, even with the macronutrients like calcium, I worked with a university, and the researcher was trying to grow E. coli. Spent three weeks, cannot get a simple bacterium, a relatively simple bacterium like E. coli to grow. They were looking at a paper which actually had a mistake. They were not adding calcium. A simple macronutrient. One thing easily overlooked. They were like thinking, well, it's got its um, carbon sources and all that. But they did not add calcium. It would not grow. Then it was a bit of a debate for about two days as to what the role of calcium and why it's needed for a microorganism. They presumed that just because they had organics, it was sufficient for E. coli to grow and hard to justify. A paper could be wrong. So we track back there all through the references. They just happen to forget to add calcium in the paper. Frustratingly, three weeks later. But there's other micronutrients. Those are the easily can be overlooked. You know, the boron, cobalt, copper, iron, magnesium, molybdenum. They need it too, whether you add it in the supplements or basically add something that may contain it already. But basically, I've actually seen people try to do um, bioremediation. As you can see, associated with these micronutrients, they're associated with enzymes. And I'll be talking about enzymes later today. But they were trying to do bioremediation. They were rejecting microorganisms, giving it its carbon source, because you know they're putting this in the groundwater and it tends to be quite depleted on organic carbon, nitrogen, phosphorus. They were trying everything. But what they were trying to do was needing is cobalt. They spent a couple of years in a field trial trying to get bioremediation to occur, and they could not get it to work because they presumed that a microorganism will get its metals from the ground. But the type of mineral structures and the conditions in the groundwater was completely deplete of cobalt. That micronutrient basically caused the um, project to um, fail. And it wasn't until they actually tried to discuss this with a biochemist three years later. And of course there's the others, the nickel, selenium, tungsten, vanadium, zinc. All are needed, generally associated with enzymes. Basically, the proteins that actually will carry out an activity of a cell. But I also said they need vitamins, just like us. So all the B series, you know, the vitamin Bs, the vitamin K, all that. They can either make it themselves, 
or they can get it from others. But they, it is all needed. In fact, you can even think about it in our own gastrointestinal tracts. Could the microorganisms also be helping by providing us with some of these nutrients? So that's why they always talk about you know, maintaining gastrointestinal health, the microorganisms, because some of them actually do produce um, things that we need for our diet, and one of which, or a series of which, are vitamins. But you know, a lot of them you can see, um, it's all, we'll get into a little more details, but they're actually associated with this energy production. So basically, why do they need this stuff? Carbon, obviously we're, it's a building block. It's almost every part of our body needs carbon at some point. It's also our source of energy. But microorganisms are a bit trickier, I mean, in terms of understanding. We get our carbon from what? Food, organics. We're basically heterotrophs. Not all bacteria are heterotrophs. They can get carbon from basically atmosphere. I mean, a simple example, photosynthetic microorganisms. But there are others. You know, the ammonia oxidizing bacteria that drive our nutrient cycles. They get their carbon from carbon dioxide. So we need to be a kind of cognizant of the carbon that they will also will need. The other thing that we'll get in a little more detail when I talk about bioremediation and redox systems, could you give um, a big soup of organics to, say, sulfate-reducing bacteria? Basically, bacteria that to convert sulfate, sulfate to sulfide. Sulfur is often manipulated to control the fate of metals. So SRBs, the sulfate-reducing bacteria, are often used in the engineering. And it's amazing, some of my students, they will take up ground up proteins, enzyme digested cell mass, and try to feed it to the SRBs. They are heterotrophs, but they cannot assimilate or process complex macromolecules of a large nature. Methanogens, methane producers, what do they need for carbon? Well, we talk about, you know, you know, loading up all these digesters with food stuff. Where did they actually get their carbon from? It's not from the food stuff. It's actually either, it's a broken down products of fermentation, acetate, carbon dioxide. You give them any other source of carbon, they don't know what to do with it. So it's not as just simply as, oh, it's a heterotroph, I'm just going to give it a, um, I don't know, I used to use American analogy, give them just a McDonald's Big Mac or something like that, it's a complex meal. No, they will not be able to take it. And like I said, some of them have to get their carbon from carbon dioxide. It doesn't matter what you give it to them organically. They all need nitrogen, but what type of nitrogen? They need it for their proteins, nucleic acids, and other cellular parts. But what do you give it to them? You know, some will give them as nitrate, and you know, some of them can actually use it. They will basically will assimilate it and can actually reduce it. But most commonly, ammonia is what they prefer. But also keep in mind, some of them are basically adept to getting it from the atmosphere. The atmosphere is something some percent nitrogen gas, but there's actually a few of them. And amazing, it's just a very few of them that can actually take the nitrogen from the air and actually use it and convert it into biomass. But in most cases, what it will be is, you know, the organic matter, or basically the products of nitrogen processes and ultimately ammonia is often the easiest. So when you see farmers fertilize their fields, some of them will use nitrate. Well, that's not ideal, but um, also runs into risk of groundwater pollution. But then you also will see others that will actually spray ammonia. Probably a little more dangerous, but also a little more effective. The other advantage of ammonia at certain pH is it becomes a cation and it tends to sorb onto soil particles. Phosphorus is needed for its um, ATP, that's the adenosine triphosphate. That is the currency of energy. They also need it for the nucleic acids and their lipids.
phospholipids are for membrane structures. Cells can only get it in a very simplest form, phosphate, or very short chains of polyphosphate. They generally cannot take up organic phosphate, but they are capable of releasing enzymes, this is one of their strategies, to actually convert the organic phosphorus into phosphate, particularly phosphatases, the alkaline or acidic phosphatases. But basically, it all gets incorporated as phosphate into the cell and basically will go almost immediately is to the ATP pathways. And from there, it can get transferred to other parts of the cell. Oxygen. Do all bacteria need oxygen? That's a, tick, a trick question I usually give my students. Yes, they need oxygen. They need it for their cellular part, but how do they get it? That's the big difference. For, me, uh, for us, we use oxygen as a, basically as an electron acceptor. We can obviously incorporate it into other things. But generally, all microorganisms do need oxygen because it is for their cellular components. But they can get it from other compounds, not oxygen. Now, what oxygen O2 for us is basically is an electron acceptor. Some microorganisms will use that in a similar manner as basically for respiration. They will take in their food stuff, the energy, the electrons, and they ultimately will transfer it and reduce oxygen to water, similar to what we do in respiration. Those are aerobes. So they require it for oxygen. But then there are some microorganisms that oxygen is extremely toxic to them. Then they would be is the anaerobes, particularly the obligate anaerobes. So they are the bacteria that if they're exposed to oxygen, it actually is quite toxic. It breaks down to, to basically highly reactive radicals, and they are, do not have the enzymes to basically detoxify um, basically the toxicity of basically the oxygen molecules. So they are obligate. So if you're trying to grow those, you basically really have to strive to keep them out of the atmosphere. You know, transfers in um, anaerobic chambers and keep them sealed to basically minimize again whatever percent portion of the twenty some percent that's in our atmosphere. But then there are those who are basically adept for both conditions, and those are the facultative anaerobes. Those are actually quite easier to work with because the aerobes once they run out of oxygen, they basically die. Facultative. Once they run out of oxygen, they just switch their metabolism and go to an anaerobic respiration. And I'll talk about that as well. So you need to be aware of basically the conditions that they need for oxygen. Sulfur, they can either get it from basically from sulfides, sulfates, or basically organics. Uh, generally, sulfates are a little more trickier for them. But basically, they do need it. And um, you can think of some of the reactions that occur in soils or in the ground related to sulfur. Basically, is um, coordinate basically reacts with metals. Well, inside the cell, similar process. They use the sulfur is to basically coordinate the metals inside their body, whether it's for detoxification, but it is used in proteins to basically coordinate the metal component the cofactors as often is used in their enzymes. So that sulfur is a component very similar to the environment for controlling metals, the same thing in a cell. They do need iron as we need iron. Why do we need iron? Predominantly it's basically for our blood, for the transportation of oxygen, um, for our respiration. Same thing for the, a lot of the microorganisms. They need the iron is basically is for their electron transport, part of their respiration, the cytochrome. And actually, they, some of the microorganisms are so highly dependent on iron that actually they try to take it from other organisms, and those are our pathogens. A lot of pathogens actually are high iron uptakers. Um, and actually, they are can be so aggressive is that they can actually release compounds, citrophores, to actually sequester the iron. 
And actually, there are medical researchers actually trying to find ways to combat the siderophore compounds, kind of the anti-siderophores. But then again, you can also think about the siderophores. We can actually utilize that in terms of um, engineering, particularly in soil conditions. Siderophores are basically organic secretions. Um, they are pseudoproteins. They're not exactly proteins, but they're protein-like. They're basically organics excreted into the environment and actually can chelate and complex with metals, increasing their, well, they can actually increase solubilities, but it basically is a way for them to sequester. So they excrete this chemical and goes into the environment. Once it kind of joins and recognizes the iron, it becomes actually a bit more hydrophobic then it gets drawn back to the cell. So it actually now, it gets diffused into the environment, but one spot it chemically changes, and it kind of has affinity to go back to the cell. And from that point, it gets shuttled back in. When we talk about uh, lateritic sites, laterites. Okay. There, the rock having a lot of magnesium and iron. Yeah. It's oxidized. Must be a bacterial activity. And laterites are formed. So iron is a catalyst. If iron is not there, laterites cannot get formed. Yeah. So is there a correlation between the formation of laterites and the bacterial activity? Well, I'm not really sure for certain, but I do know of um, actually people are investigating how microbial activities can actually um, affect the mineralization or geochemical uh, conditions. Uh, for example, I have a project where I'm looking at the volcanic vents, and they are basically looking at is how sulfur and the mineral uh, metals in the area um, basically will start forming various different types of minerals or crystalline crystals. And they understand that okay, the sulfide comes out of the volcanic vent and gets oxidized, but Often they cannot predict, just basically on that simple analogy of that, okay, sulfide comes up, it oxidizes, becomes sulfate, because sometimes the sulfate incorporates with other things and becomes that mineral, but their finding is that you're getting other mineral formation form. I'm not a geologist, it's kind of hard for me to explain, but they're finding differences in the character, the geochemical composition. And what they're finding after I went there and I started explaining to them about the patterns of what I see are quite evident bacterial growth, it's actually correlating that some of the differences in the geochemical character that they're seeing surrounding the vent actually might be associated with the bacteria. That maybe they are changing the way the sulfur, whether it's rates and how it interacts, or maybe they're just subtly changing the pHs and basically reactions are proceeding differently and coming up with different products. So they're recognizing now that these little slight differences that could not be explained just by, by, by um, geochemistry may actually have a biological or biogeochemical influence. Does it have a question? I What is the form? Whether it is fluid or ferrous or liquid form, it can consume it. They will probably, yeah, I don't know exactly about for the iron, but I work with is um, a calcophore, which is a very analogous um, compound. It's used to sequester copper. And what it can do is actually chemically react with the copper, and it's also a reductant. So it will actually convert copper 2 to copper 1. And it's quite possible that, I'm not really certain, but siderophores may have similar mechanisms. A lot of the um, chelators being released by bacteria are also reductants and also antioxidants. So actually a lot of people in biomedical are investigating them for that property as well. So normally there is an understanding that if a soil has more iron, it will be more stable. It won't then decompose easily. Mm -hmm. Okay. Supposed to be a stable material, special gravity level will be high. Well, it's supposed to be inert material. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of dynamics in play here. I mean, there is toxicity 
because um, I do see with um, bacteria, for example, that are um, in high iron um, soils have to have a lot more, or I notice that they tend to have a lot more metal or antimicrobial resistance, basically defense mechanisms to conditions in their environment. Um, but I mean, so there is always, you know, you can have too much of something, it can become toxic. Uh, but then again, you have to also think about what form is the iron in? Is it bioavailable? If it's bioavailable, then of course it probably will not take much because it immediately goes to a cell before it has an response. But also the other side of it is that if it's bioavailable and sufficient quantity for basically not being toxic, um, the cells probably will not waste the energy in producing these sideral fours because it's basically available. They might just shut down and just take whatever can get to them through absorption from the environment. But if they have a sense that there might be some there, maybe not enough, then they might get a little more aggressive and they'll start doing the chemical attack, particularly the calcophor that I studied will actually will start decomposing minerals. And I have evidence that suggests that it will break down the silicates even, which is a very tough mineral to break down. But it certainly will attack the um, oxides. Um, so it's a, it's a play of concentration and response of the bacteria. Uh, I, as a toxicologist, I cannot say it's very easy to predict. So maybe high concentrations of iron. Well, if it's not available to a microorganism that has it, basically the microorganisms just don't have a sense of it there. They not, may not be there at all because of basically lack of a nutrient. Or if they were aggressive, then they would probably start attacking. But it also could just be, it might be toxic. So, hard to say. But interestingly, a micronutrient or a macronutrient, they will have strategies of trying to get it. And actually, particularly with some of it, it may actually have a bit of a consequence because some of these chelators can actually start attacking infrastructure. So that's always a possibility. I am gonna go very quickly, it's actually through metabolism. Um, biochemistry galore. Please don't pay attention to that. But it'll just give you a sense of basically the pathways that are involved. And they're just basically the similar pathways for us. But give you also a sense of what is happening and why under one condition, microbes get produce very little energy. In other conditions, they can actually have a lot. But it also gives you a sense is also is what, why some of these nutrients are needed, but also, you know, how environmental conditions can also, you know, toxicants may it actually impact these microorganisms. But I mean, there's two types of metabolism. We take in food for ourselves. Why? Because we need the building blocks for our biomass. That is anabolism. It's basically taking the precursors and making bigger stuff with it. There's also catabolism, which is the other side is actually is the breakdown and basically is breaking the bonds to release energy, is energy creation. And I, as I tell my students, if you get confused between catabolism and animalism, think about steroid use, anabolic steroids. Why do weightlifters take it? It's to build up body, um, body mass. So that's where the terms relate to. The thing about energy, it's ATP on a cellular level. Adenosine triphosphate. So you got the series of phosphate bonds. And it's basically those phosphate bonds are what stores the energy. So you create ATP, you store up the energy. If you need energy, you just take an ATP molecule, crack one off one of those um, phosphates, there's your energy. So it's their way of controlling and basically transporting energy wherever it might be needed in the cell. And in the long term, they can form polymers and just kind of be broken down ultimately to use, to generate ATP. And truthfully, the formation of polymers is probably analogous, you know, basically some of our storage mechanisms as well. But maybe a bit different because they do the, I mentioned, there's the PHAs, the PHBs. I'm not gonna go into that too much. But I mean, the easiest thing about bio, 
looking at the biochemistry of metabolism is actually looking at the glucose or sugar molecule. Truthfully, if you take biochemistry, you probably will start off with this, and immediately you go into the other pathways. So there's a lot of pathways involved in this, and if you want to study that, take biochemistry. Because what I'm going to show you is only three of the pathways, and truthfully, when I took biochemistry, I had pathways written on my flat, flat wall, that basically all four walls being included. But if you think about glucose, you give a micro glucose. What is the first thing it does? Is it basically will activate the glucose. Right there, they're going to be expending energy to basically phosphorylate glucose and ultimately transforming it into basically phosphofructose. So right there, they just wasted energy. But ultimately, it goes through a series of reactions by enzymes, and the net product would be four ATPs. So they spend two ATPs to prime the reaction, but ultimately they get four ATPs out of it. It's like investing two units of currency, money, and getting four back. So that's a sufficient rate of return. If that's all they can do, and they can also go further down into basically what the product of the um, glucose molecule is, a, you know, going from a six carbon down to pyruvate, which is a three carbon. So basically all they're doing is taking the glucose and snapping it in half. That's glycolysis. And then further it can go down into basically fermentations, and that's how we get our basically our organic acids, our ethanol and um, basically the precursors like acetates and carbon dioxide for methanogenesis. So if, if that's all it is, and it's basically an aerobic system, you get is 2 ATP. But what if you have oxygen? What it will do is take the pyruvate and basically go through a series of reactions, first off removing one of the carbons and making it a 2, two carbon, and basically, what it'll do is incorporate it into the, what's called the Krebs cycle or a citric acid cycle. And what they will do is basically start transforming what was a three, to put it into a two, acetyl CoA, put it into a system that already has a four, and start making, you know, C6 compounds. And then basically start snapping off bonds around the process. And in the process, what they will do is they'll transfer the energy to what I would call shuttle energy molecules. In this case, that's the NADH, NADPHs, nicotinamide, uh, denosine, dinucleotide, and FADHs. I'm not going to go into the details of the molecules. But what they will do is they will snap the bonds, basically, transfer the energy to other molecules. And this will just be a cycle. It's like almost like a generator. And what they'll do is transfer the energy into something, a molecule. And what these molecules will do then is go to the um, membranes. So you, what you'll see there is the NADHs that's been charged up. The FADH2s that are basically are charged. You know, they have the protons and along that with the, the electrons. So what they will do is start breaking down those compounds through basically a series of proteins in your membranes. Basically your cytochromes, your quinolone, on basically flavor proteins. And what they will do is basically harvest those electrons and they will shuttle them down through the membranes in a controlled manner. But in the process, they shuttle the electrons the protons get expelled outside of the cell. But look what happens to the charges on each side of the membranes. You have on the outside, the environmental side, it's predominantly positive. In the cytoplasm, it's predominantly negative. What do you got? A battery electrochemical gradient.
electrochemical gradient that could potentially be used to charge up another process. That's the um, proton motive force. So they are, one, controlling the flow of electrons, and second is creating that electrochemical gradient. It's quite analogous. If you were to take a substrate, do you just immediately release the electrons? You would probably spontaneously combust. You have to control the flow of electrons through basically a series of shuttling reactions. It's almost like each step along the way, it's actually a change in the reduction potential. So you basically are controlling redox reactions. Same thing that would happen in the environment if you're looking at redox. But what they would do, they create this electrochemical gradient. They will take that and they will, the protons will go back into the cells because the positive will go to the negative, opposites attract. But they will do that through a enzyme called ATP synthase. That basically is a mechanism to generate ATP. So what it will do is the protons will move in and cause the machine to ratchet, move. And in the process, actually provides the energy that ultimately takes the ADP, the adenosine diphosphate, and starts attaching phosphates, and ultimately printing out new currency or generating ATP. Do people try to exploit all this? They are microbes generate energy, and people are now trying to find ways to harvest that energy. Biological fuel cells. I'll talk about that probably tomorrow. But what the advantage is, is that each of those little NADHs, the nicotinamide, adenosine, dinucleotide compounds, and all those FDHs, they basically shuttle the electrons. They, each of those electrons ultimately get shuttled through and creates a proton motor force. That ultimately contributes to the ratcheting and creating the ATP. But anyways, if you just basically rely on just splitting of the glucose, six carbon molecule to three carbon pyruvate, you generate only two ATPs. But if you take advantage of the, um, basically the Krebs cycle and the uh, membrane oxidative um, phosphorylations, or sub all those um, phosphorylation, you can actually generate actually about 30 some ATP. So the advantage of respiration is that in your investment of two ATP, you come out with 38 or 30 some ATPs. Whereas if you're a fermenter, no oxygen, no respiration, and that's a separation between respiration and fermenters, is that fermentation has those additional steps of the Krebs cycle and those pathways. Fermenters just take the pyruvate and just kind of shuttle the electrons between the organics. Fermenters only can generate two. So if you want to take your pick of you want the greatest activity from your microorganisms, have them be more on the respiration side, the re fermenters. But microorganisms can still respire even though they do not have oxygen. They will take advantage of whatever they can find in the environment that might already be oxidized as alternative forms than oxygen. If there's no oxygen, if the microorganisms can take in and utilize nitrate, they will shuttle the electrons to nitrate instead of oxygen. And they will change the um, nitrate and convert it to basically reduction down to nitrite and ultimately to N2 gas. Do they still generate the energy levels? About the same as it would be for oxygen maybe very slightly less. If there's no nitrate, they can actually even start attacking oxidized metals. If there's ferric iron or oxidized manganese, um, any of those metals that might have a, be an oxidative state, they will basically can shuttle their electrons and actually change or reduce those metals and change their valency states. So they can actually start attacking the metal composition 
Once they do that, they will go to sulfate, reduce it down to sulfur, or ultimately sulfide, so on and so forth. So alternately, they have other means, and they can generate energy, but in the consequence, it might actually have impacts into the surrounding environment. And particularly when they start attacking metals and sulfur, it can actually impact the fate of those compounds. It can actually affect the fate, particularly of metals in the environment. So it can change the geological chemistry very easily. More later, obviously. Where do they get their energy? Some microorganisms don't need organics. They can actually use other compounds. Uh, there are those who, this is where to get the source of electrons. They can take sulfide, and in the process, they'll take the electrons off the sulfide, and in the process, they also oxidize the sulfur. So it's a similar thing. They can change the dynamics of the sulfur, and they can also do the, some of the metals, like ferrous iron, they can change the valence state, and ultimately changing the geochemical character in the environment. In this case, they're just taking, in a reduced environment, they can take the electrons and use that as an energy source. Other compounds, ammonia, ammonia oxidizing bacteria. That's what they use the ammonia for. It's a source of energy, their electrons. Hydrogen, all are reduced and have electrons that can be taken. Uh, phototropes, they just get their energy, obviously, from sunlight. But the proton motor force is involved with if they are respirers, and as well as photosynthesis. How does this work in a eukaryote? Truthfully, the same way. The only thing is, instead of being a bacterial cell, eukaryotes will do it in their mitochondria. And if you remember from a previous lecture, mitochondria are basically where endosymbiont probably derived from bacteria. So what's driving the energy in our cells is nothing more than it's just a very, very slight modification of what bacteria were doing in the environment previously. It's just where you just have it in an organelle rather than just being a full cell. Animalism. I'm going to deviate a little bit. How many of you have heard the different theories of how life is formed? I'm not going to try to, I'm not going to, I'm not treading on religions or anything like that. I'm, so if, if it seems like I am, I apologize. But there is a kind of a, a belief out there and how they basically, how did life form in the universe? How many of you have heard of the Miller-Urey experiments? Very common. 1950s, the, basically a uh, biochemist decided, oh, I'm just going to take water, methane, you know, the compositions of some of these atmospheres on the planetary bodies, um, water, methane, ammonia, hydrogen, and basically just circulate it through and give it a charged spark. In that experiment, he probably did not realize at that time, but when it was replicated and actually his results were reanalyzed, he actually created over 20 amino acids. How many amino acids did I say there were in yesterday's lecture, just over 20. Interesting. So there's always this belief that what was it? This is a primordial soup of reduced compounds and either electrical charges or maybe some energetic force from space came in and basically um, created or just provided the energy to create these molecules, which ultimately became a mixture and ultimately reacted and formed life. There's another one. I think I saw a lot of nods on the Miller-Urey experiments. How many of you heard of the clay theory? I see a couple of more directional changes here in the head. This is an interesting idea. Certain compounds, crystals, they form a certain way. And they may break apart, but each of the subparts will reform in a very similar manner. And it's often based off the template of their previous form. So some aspects, the crystals replicate, and they kind of self-replicate. Now, if you go into some of the clay layers, 
And basically, some of the other layers might form based off of the previous clays. And there, so there might be is just kind of a replication, a copying based off of the other crystalline or shapes or chemical compositions of the previous layers. But what if something in that clay changes slightly? Will that change be replicated in the subsequent formations? And some people have found evidence it does. But it goes even further than that. What if that slight chemical change, which can be copied, actually changes the character of, let's say, that crystal or that clay? Maybe it makes it a little bit stickier, and it's less likely to be, I don't know, washed away or, you know, moved. What if there's a slight change and makes it characteristically slightly better? and it remains in the environment. And if it's self-replicating, that slight change might be reproduced later. I should go back to that guy's work, but um, people who are actually investigating that, it's very theoretical, and I know people are investigating that now. This is actually is a, a biochemist, um, and very much in the theory that, that maybe the these slight changes in these clays could actually be self-replicating and actually have a selection process, which is almost very ecological. But it's also it's also is believed that these clays can actually form templates, and you might actually have some of the organics that were created by the Miller Urey experiments. They might actually might re interact and then become a template and become start forming polymers. He has this idea that that was what was creating RNA in the world. But what he wrote in 1985 was a very controversial book that life probably was originated. It was just basically inorganic reactions that happened to be replicatable and basically catalyzed the formation of other complex molecules and was basically forming as basically templates for RNA. From RNA, and as I will talk about anabolism, is that when you have some of these organics, whether it's amino acids or RNA, it can actually get transferable to metabolism to other compounds, which actually become the building blocks of life. So something to think about or ponder. And any evidence? People are actually investigating that now. It was actually very controversial, um, this was in 1985, but it has actually spurred a whole di different thought, particularly how you know, maybe things how actually might interact. Karen Smith, um, by the way, is actually a Glaswegian, um, well honored and all that for his work in biochemistry and molecular biology. Uh, unfortunately, he did pass away three months ago. What he was proposing is a abiotic synthesis of small organic molecules and basically through their interactions based off of a template such as the clay layers start forming polymers, the proteins, the nucleic acids and that they became self-replicating and inheritance basically passing on the templates onto the next generations of formations uh, basically for forming basically these proto Bions. And some of them are basically, you know, like micelle development. You can get lipid, um, lipids, you know, those um, building blocks for, um, you know, membranes. They can kind of self form, self anneal as well. So you basically was saying that basically the template might have originated from the inorganic, but ultimately became polymers and they just start self assembling. Truthfully, I think it was a bigger leap to go from, say, clay to RNA. I would say that's a bigger leap than saying that we evolved from bacteria to human. But that's my opinion. A major leap there. Here's something else to consider about life. We're familiar with the periodic table, right? So some of the elements within the same column will always have very similar properties. Does life have to be a carbon base? How many sci-fi movies have you seen where they suggested that maybe they'll be silicon-based? 
Remember I said earlier, two days ago, that I often use sci-fi, science fiction. Could life be silicon-based? Well, you look at carbon, which is a 6, and silicon is a 14. They're very similar. Or how about, like, number 15, phosphorus and arsenic? Very interestingly, they pondered this for decades in science fiction. The Andromeda Strain, the original movie, basically had this life-like virus that was silicon-based. And that basically carried on some of the properties. And then in that movie, they pondered, really, what is life, character of life? But that, that virus-like thing was a silicon. And, you know, that's from the movie. But in the 2008 version, they went to a sulfur base. But basically, it was a crystalline structure that was self-replicating, but actually controlled biochemical reactions. Phosphorus versus arsenic. This is highly contentious, but about seven years ago, someone suggested that um, bacterium can grow using arsenic instead of phosphorus. I have my opinions on that, truthfully. But people are investigating that alternatives in these building blocks and these biochemistries might actually be relevant. What if a bacterium can grow on arsenic instead of phosphorus? How does that shape geomicrochemistry or ge uh, microgeochemistry? You know, consider all the places with arsenic pollution. Arsenic leaching is because of uh, bacterial action? Well, the bacteria can actually will change the, um, the chemical composition. You know, they can reduce the environments and it can actually, you know, release compounds like the, you know, the chromium or oxidation, causing the release of other compounds. But they're right there trying to figure out, could actually a microbe actively assimilate arsenic and utilize it? We're aware of that microorganisms can change the environmental conditions and cause the, um, the binding, precipitation, or release of a compound. This is actively simulating it and using it for their own purposes. And you know, of course, you know, we all have this debate with, um, um, you know, Star Trek, they encountered silicon life forms. But truthfully, last year, they found actually there's enzymes that can actively use and incorporate Silicon. Is it science fiction? Or is it becoming a reality? So our days of watching science fiction over how many years might actually might actually come true. Personally, I would like to see more information. I think there's more should be more thing, more in step two along the process. Particularly I think in the terms of the clay theory. But the people are investigating this. They're determining this. And truthfully, my opinion is, what is life? I find, I tell, I like this quote by Lynn Morgalis. It's a linguistic trap. The answer means you have to violate the rules of grammar because you need a noun. Life is not a thing. It's more of a verb. It's the actions and things that you do. Silicon computer chips and, you know, Silicon Valley. Yeah, you know, they actually are getting, oh, you're talking about actually implementations of, you know, Silicon life. Yeah, it's a major component of the prosthetic parts and all that. Yes. Yes. But as a life form, are they actively doing that rather than just being transplanted with, yeah. I thought you were thinking of all of our uh, computers and mobile devices, all those silicon devices controlling our lives. They do that too. But I mean, we are, we have many different micromolecules, um, basically of dry weight, you know, probably half proteins and, you know, polysaccharides and all that. And, you know, obviously there are different types of them, you know, the, you know molecules, per, diff, molecules per cell and different types of those molecules. I mean, there's probably about, you know, 1,800 different proteins and accounting for probably about 2 million um, proteins in a cell. But it gives you a sense of basically how many building blocks, products are in a cell. And obviously, going for the macromolecules uh, to the monomers, the precursors, obviously, their composition as well. Because you only have 100 you know, amino acids and precursors uh, to generate you know, probably 2,000 different types of proteins. But anyways, how, what happens geochemically, I mean, bio, biochemically, is you know, we get our sugars, which could be the glucoses, um, which are hexa six chain, fructoses, but we also have the pentoses, the riboses, and all that. Those are basically the 
monomers or the precursors ultimately for all of the polysaccharides, the starches, uh, celluloses, the glycogens, and obviously they can have incorporated modifications that be part of lipids, proteins, and all that. You know, we got our fatty acids. They basically are the building blocks, you know, basically for our triglycerides and phospholipids. So they get chemically modified and basically become the building blocks for our membranes. Nucleic acids become nucleotides. Those become our DNA and RNA. And amino acids, polypeptides, and proteins. But basically, they need to be provided these building blocks or they have to be synthesized. So either they get it from the media or from the nature, or they might have to be synthesized. And obviously, if they can sequester it and obtain it, they would prefer, because it'll probably be less energy. But anyways, it's a balance. Getting the substrates, converting it into products, generate the energy, but ultimately spending that energy to invest in building up body parts. But what's really kind of interesting is you think about all these cycles, a lot of them can go into reverse. So instead of breaking things down, they can actually be kind of go into a reverse with some modification and we actually start building up molecules. And actually they can take certain molecules from each of these processes that I just told you about and slightly change them to ultimately create another product. This is kind of going into the field of biosynthesis is that basically a cell, because of evolution, is very efficient in taking each of those molecules in its bi geochemistry, not geo, why am I saying geochemistry, biochemistry, and um, basically getting them to reconvert into other things that are needed. So each of those compounds that I highlighted so far can actually play in a role in doing something else to the cell. So instead of just building it up from scratch, they just borrow from a process. So, for example, the glucose can be obviously changed to become ribose. And the ribose is basically is what goes into the ribonucleotides that ultimately form RNA and DNA. How do they form amino acids? Well, they basically will take compounds from the citric acid cycle and basically modify them, and they become basically the building blocks for proteins, the alpha-ketoglutarates, the oxaloacetates, or they will take glycolysis, the pyruvates, or the phosphoglycerates, and um, basically will start forming other amino acids. So they basically will just take compounds that already exist from the processes I just mentioned and just basically divert them to other assembly lines. So you think about it, you're going from the origin of life being presented by the, you know, the clay theory, you know, basically the precursor for RNA, the, you know, all the generations of the amino acids from the miller uli experiment, how they incorporate into all this, and ultimately the chemical pathways start interlinking. Why did they use the word clay theory? I, I'm actually quite curious, and I would like a geochemical input from people who work with clays. It, it's the idea that like, this is the um, the layers, the chemical, I mean, the chemical layering, the clays. If there's a slight change in the chemical composition in that layer, how does it impact on the next layer? I am not a geochemist to answer that. I think certainly that would be a very good discussion because as a microbiologist with a bit more biochemistry, I'd be quite curious to actually tease out the logic and all that. Well, I was going to say I knew the guy because he was in Glaswegian, but unfortunately he passed away. And, but um, yes. That's so interesting. I'll look it up. Because there is a philosophy life comes from nowhere. But now you're hinting that life comes from place. Well, some religions um, life originated from the earth, and in the, particularly in Christianity, life was created, molded as a clay to form the, you know, Adam and Eve. I often wonder, are we, is there a slight religious bias in all this too? It's kind of, kind of worth, um, you know, investigating to tease out. It's highly controversial. I have my opinions on it, and people have their opinions, and then there's a, Obviously, those who, you know, have a very strong opinion as well.
controversy. You see, the life comes out of the clay definitely because on rocks, vegetation is limited. Mm -hmm. They decompose and they form clay. Clay is the mesonomer. Clay could be soil. Yeah. And then this is where the bacterial activity helps and the vegetation grows and life evolves. So I find a lot of logic in this thing. Yeah, I understand that. Yeah, I understand the uh, soil genesis, you know, the breakdown of the minerals. I mean, basically, they break down the minerals from smaller particles, and you get to have all the other interactions to basically the organic matter and all that to basically better retain nutrients, water, and all that, which will help provide, yeah, basically, media for soup. It becomes a part of the life cycle. It does, yeah. In rock cycle, we should add another component that this is a life cycle. Yeah, I'll see if I can find the um, the book and, and there I know there are some experiments where people are investigating that and I'll see if I can find those as well. It's worth a discussion. There's the amino acids and all that. Nucleotides, nucleic acids, um, basically they come from various different carbon sources. Um, Basically, you know, it comes in taking the aspartate, which is amino acids. It's borrowing the formal groups. Um, this is chemistry. Um, basically from lipid synthesis and all that. But ultimately, you can see they're taking parts of biochemical processes and um, actually reassembling them in a rather efficient manner to create what they need within the cell. Fatty acid cycle, acetyl-CoA all that. I'm not going to go into details of the biochemistry, but remember the original question. Why would bacteria not survive in a bowl of sugar? As you have mentioned, the macronutrients, a place of sugar being a source of carbon. Apart from that, the macronutrients, apart from the nitrogen as well as other macronutrients are also required for its survival. Yeah. It's rather interesting. Um, because, like I was saying in the lecture, is people rely on microorganisms to do things in nature, but they often forget what's their nitrogen source, what's their phosphorus source, are metals available? Okay, yes, metals are there, but are they available? Well, total metal counts are this. Does a microbe see total metal? No, they see dissolved metal, or simpler, complex metals. Um, so that is certainly one thing, is that there is a very strong lacking of other nutrients, to basically, that they need to sustain life. The other one is, has anyone um, basically kept a sweet in their mouth for an excessive period of time? You know, what happens if you're chewing on something very sweet for a long period of time? You get that strange feeling in your cheeks and your gums and your tongue. What, is wa um, what happens to the water in the presence of sugar? Sugar sorbs water. Um, it was, um, my kids went to a school and they were, were uh, awarded, this is kind of like the end of the semester type treat. They were able to go to a sweet shop and buy a sweet. This kid bought a sweet that was about that big. I was going to say the size of a baseball, but you can imagine the size of it's like a tennis ball. Um, and he, for all day, was licking it. And the next thing you know, they just heard the kid screaming with blood coming from his mouth. He was licking this sugar substance for so long, his tongue dried out and split. So it's also not only is the, um, the nutrient content that might be a concern for whether or not you get bacteria growing or not, but also some of the natural environmental conditions, truthfully in this case, are quite unsuitable to sustain any sort of life because of the um, innate property of hydration. Basically, sugar will hydrate, take water from things. So, something to do with the crystal structure. And then we'll go into the hygroscopic properties of sugar, but um, I will, for example, will use sugar in my fermentation um, of substrates, like extracting the syrups from plant material. 
So I would take um, plants and I would just coat it with sugar. And what it does, it desiccates, it draws out the moisture and other things out, basically take, draws out the syrups out of plants. Sugar, by the way, did you know it's a preservant? Think about how food was prepared throughout history. It's a preservant. It's a preservative, along with salts, oils, other things. 